Uh, it's up on the board, 273 to 322. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're recording, so I'll post this. Should be able to get it up as long as I remember to stop it in the correct spot. Only going to be about um, 45 minutes. Fair enough. <laughs> well, about 50, including the, the this and the news. Ah, I guess it's hard. All right, so. Uh, one of the questions, uh, there's five questions. Somebody asked it earlier, so I'll just tell you five questions on the quiz. One of them is just like this. Give you different ordered pairs. And I say, are the lines parallel, perpendicular, or neither? So, and I may not put the exact same notation. I honestly I don't remember how I did it, but the, the concept is these two points make up one, or they are on a line. These two points are on a completely different line. You need to figure out if those two lines are parallel to each other, perpendicular to each other, or neither. They're, they connect some way, but it's not perpendicular. All you need to do is what? It's all boils down to one thing. You can't graph, I mean, you, you might be able to graph it if it's really easy to see, but don't count on that on a district test. So I want you to do it the way we're about to do it. So what is that way? What is it you have to do? We have to compare what? Reach line, slope. We have to just calculate out what's the slope for that line? What's the slope for that line? If we get the same number, then they're parallel. If the slope is the same, they are parallel. If we don't get the same number, then we need to test to see if they are perpendicular. How do we do that? We multiply them. If they're perpendicular, what answer will we get when we multiply them? Negative one, good. So I'm gonna go through that whole process. First process, label the points. I consider this to be my first point, for this line at least, so I'm gonna call that X1, Y1. That's all the ones mean is that's my first point. This is my second point, so I'm gonna label it X2, that's a two, X2, Y2. This over here is still going to be X1 because it's a different line. It's going to be X1, Y1, X2, Y2. Um, once you do that part, the rest of it is just like plugging numbers into a formula, multi multiplying two slopes together. And that's not that that's difficult, but that's probably the hardest part. I guess it's not difficult, but that's the part where you'll make your mistakes most likely. Now I just say, okay, for the first line, I need to plug in my Y2 and subtract my Y1. You just look at the way you labeled it or subtract. Do not forget the negative on the number. If there's a negative, the subtraction sign does not replace the negative sign. Then three subtract negative one. And we get seven divided by four. So that is the slope of the first one. Now we do the same exact process, but just using the two ordered pairs in the other line. Nine subtract negative two, negative six subtract five, positive 11 over negative 11. Are they the same slope? Absolutely not. They'd be the same number, right? Or we might have to simplify it down. Remember, that could be possible where you have to take them and simplify them into a smaller fraction. Uh, you could just say top number divided by the bottom number, we said, and make it a decimal and then compare the two decimal numbers. That was another way to do it if you're not particularly 
confident in your ability to simplify fractions. However you figure it out, you got to know if that's the same number or not. This one's pretty obvious. It's definitely not the same number. You can actually already tell it's not the perpendicular slope because what would the perpendicular slope for this be? You should all be able to do that. That's what you have to do for the top two. Subjects. How do we take this and turn it into a perpendicular slope? Twice, right? So the perpendicular slope to that would be that. Well, pretty easy for me to tell that is not even close to the same number. Don't get confused by the fact that this equals negative one. It doesn't have to do with just one of them being negative one. When you multiply them, they would have to be negative one. So if you didn't know that they were not perpendicular yet, that's when you would say, OK, well, I need to multiply those two slopes together. If I get, doesn't really matter where the negative sign is. I put it on the bottom. It could have been on the top 11. 77 divided by negative 44. Um, that is definitely not negative one. I would have had the only way they're perpendicular is if when you multiply them together, you get negative one. So the answer, the final, final, like to finish it off, the answer is that those are neither parallel nor perpendicular. That's the exact same thing you're going to do on one of the questions. Only difference is different numbers. Phone should be up, by the way. Uh, all right, so now look at the. I think it's the first page, 273. Um, is this what's on 273? Is that, or is that where that is, 273? Wow. So this is a super fast lesson, and then you have quite a bit of time where you're going to practice this today, and then I'll give you like maybe 10 minutes just to review notes on your for your quiz. We are moving into triangles. We actually skipped an entire chapter, entire module. It was on stuff we had kind of already done when we did transformations like rotations, reflections, translations, all that stuff. They come back and they do that again, and they add one called a dilation. At some point, we'll squeeze dilation in. Um, uh, so if I don't get a chance to come back that you've done most of it. Um, dilations has to do with like making a figure actually changing the size. When we did reflections, rotations, and translations, all we did is we slid a figure around, we flipped it, we rotated it, we never changed the side. So if for some reason we don't cover it, dilations would be the only thing that changes the size. All of the other ones are called rigid transformations because the size never changes. Again, I don't know how, I don't feel like that's a huge topic for the EOC or the, but hopefully not the midterm, but I, I do want to try to cover it because for some of you, the midterm will determine your grade for the semesters. Um, there's only really three things you need to, to use typically when it comes to doing problems with triangles. Two of them you've already learned. One of them I'm about to, you probably already learned this in seventh grade, but I'm going to remind you of it today. First, a quick definition. In a triangle, you have three angles. Those are called interior angles. They're interior because we are measuring the inside part of that angle. That's basically the inside of the triangle. Oh, I forgot to show the other class the mistake. I'll show you guys and it'll be on tape at least. This is the biggest sort of new piece. Like I said, you should have done it in seventh grade. You have got to remember, so ladies, I hope you're paying attention, Lane. The three interior angles, I'm emphasizing interior because there's a mistake that people always make, some people. The three interior angles always add up to 180 degrees. 
I don't care what the shape of the triangle is, if it's a right triangle, not a right triangle, a teeny tiny triangle, a gigantic triangle, the three angles will always add up to 180 degrees. No exceptions for triangles. If when you first did this, and I think it was seventh grade, if I give you two of the angles in and I say that one's 85 and that one's 50, you can figure out the third angle because they have to add up to 180. So that's the concept. Now the math gets tougher in high school geometry than it was in seventh grade geometry, but it's still that same concept. The three angles have to add up to 180 degrees. Here's where the mistake comes in, the first mistake. Uh, if I extend, oh, this is actually another definition first. If I extend that and I say that's 130, this is called an exterior angle. So these are interior, that is exterior. The mistake that people make is I say, I want to know the measure of angle. Oh, let's not do that. That's a little more obvious. I want to know the measure of angle B. People go, oh, well, you just told me that all three angles have to add up to 180. So those have to add up to 180. And then plus angle B has to add up to 180. Well, if I do the math, that's 40, that's 170, angle B is 10, right? Well, that is completely wrong. Because I said the interior angles, that is the interior angle. So B plus C plus 40 has to add up to 180. But you guys are so geared to where you think they're just gonna give you everything you need at the beginning of the problem, and you just take the numbers they give you that you don't think about the problem. So make sure in high school geometry that you are thinking about what they're asking you for and what you need in order to be able to solve. Um, one other thing that you need to remember, what's true, what did I just do there? Why am I doing that? Stefan, why am I doing that? What do we, what's that remind you of that we just did? No, I mean, this is from back, like what we did before. Why do we, why did we draw that kind of, why did we do that process when we had two angles like that? 180, right? That's going to really come into play a lot for triangles. The figures they give you will oftentimes extend one of the sides of the triangle, and they won't give you what's inside the triangle. They'll give you what what is outside the triangle, and make you, and that way they're testing you on two concepts. They're testing you on what we call linear pairs. So the fact that this plus this has to be 180. So if you know they have to add up to 180, you can solve for C first and say, okay, well, if they have to add up to 180, C has to be 50. Now we have two of the interior angles. So if those two add up to 90, this one has to be 90 because they have to add those three do have to add up. And then the other thing that you'll see sometimes in the in the problems, in addition to the three interior angles adding to 180, in addition to that concept of oops, careful. In addition to that concept of linear pairs, if I extend that side, that's linear pairs, those two angles add up to 180. The other thing that will come back into a play again that we haven't touched in a little while, we did it at the beginning of proofs, I think. If we extend both of the sides, we now create vertical angles. In the figure. So this angle here has the same measure as that angle here. So they might give you this angle out here instead of the interior angle. You then have to understand that that's same measure, and then you can now go through and solve for something else. Or they might give you an, an equation here and a number here, and you have to solve for the variable. Like they can do all kinds of different things. But again, vertical angles, the linear pair, and then the fact that the three interior angles add up to 180. 
Those are the only three you most of the time really need. There's one more I'm going to tell you, but you don't need to, to remember it because you can figure it out from all the other rules. So again, if I have that exterior angle, and I'll know that's 50, can you tell me what A is? First question. Ian, can you tell me what A is? Just from what I've given you in that problem. What do you think, Timothy? Can you tell me what A is? Can you tell me what B is? Can you give me an equation that's true? It may not give us any numbers, but it'd be a true equation. So we do know this. So to remind you, of your algebra. If you have two variables, two unknowns in one equation, you cannot solve with variables. You could graph it. You could give me a whole bunch of possible solutions, but you can't solve for A and B. But what do you know A and B has to equal? A plus B, that is. What does that have to equal? Even though you can't tell me what the individual is, what do they have to equal if you add them together? Not just A and B. Not just A plus B have to equal? Got to be 130, right? Because I know that this plus 50 is 180. Well, didn't we also know that this plus this has to be 180? These two also equal 180. So here's the last thing. And again, you don't need to memorize this because you can work your way into it like we just did. The exterior angle in a triangle is always equal to the sum of the two opposite interior. So if you if you just get to where you kind of remember that from doing problems, it will save you time. Nothing you won't be able to figure out on your own when you use all the other three rules we just talked about. But again, when you take state test, ACT, SAT, um, PSAT, those tests that are timed that have a lot of problems the more time you can save the better off you are so as you work through this if that's something that you can always remind yourself of even if you figured out the long way the like the first the first time you solve the problem just remember these two angles have to equal these two added together have to equal this one because basically these all add up to 180 and these have to add up to 180 that principle of 180 being involved in either situation that makes that true. Uh, there's I didn't do this with the other since I'm recording. I will tell you. I will tell you this other thing just to have it on film. So we'll say this was night. Um, I'm going to make my math really easy. Well, yeah. what what do you think the man like, you know what a 90 degree angle is, right? You all know. Do you think B is bigger or smaller than 90 degrees visually? Like, I'm just curious. Like, there, uh, this is, there's no right or wrong with this. It's a hard one to say. Raise your, if you think it's bigger than 90 degrees, raise your right hand. If you think it's smaller than 90 degrees, raise your left hand. So right now, I want everybody to tell me. Bigger than 90 is to find. Oh. Bigger than right 90, so I'm talking about this angle right here. It's kind of upside down, which makes it tough to. If it's bigger than 90, raise your right hand. If it's smaller than 90, raise your left hand. I'm talking about angle B, because it looks pretty close to 90 to me. And I I was wrong. That's why I'm asking. I'm curious if you guys have better eyes, and not because my eyes are bad and I can't see, but like just it's kind of an optical illusion to me. So I forget what it's left. Bigger or smaller? Left is smaller, right is bigger. All right. I think it's bigger. Like when I look at it, even close up, like if I look at it, I feel like it's. But I think it's actually, I'm sorry. I feel like it's bigger. I think when I measured it, it was actually small. 
So this is if you don't know what this tool is, this measures an angle. So if I put that on there, it goes to zero. Uh, oh no, actually it is bigger. I boy, I did that wrong when I did earlier. I told the class the wrong thing. I think. All right. Because I am coming up with. Yeah, I'm coming. So it is bigger. It is. It's a hundred. So I must have done something wrong in the other class. I came up with it being smaller. Four. So what is that in? Oh, I did. I did. I said forty-five. It was supposed to be thirty-five. Shoot. Yeah, that's what I meant. I actually messed up the other angle. That's what. So it is actually bigger. So never mind. I wasn't wrong. That reminds me of a joke. I thought I was wrong one time, but I wasn't. I thought I was wrong. Right. And I'm actually wrong about this. Tell that to your parents if they get it. All right. So. Um, uh, that's pretty much the lesson. Now that's it. That one figure. Now we're going to do a practice problem that you're going to look at and be like, holy crap. We're never, I'm never going to know how to do this. And after we finish it, you'll be like, oh, it wasn't even that bad. So look at page, actually, I don't know what page it is. Oh yeah, I do. Page 276. It's an example. I forget what number the example is. Oh, not that one though. I'll find the when I find the figure on it, I'll help you find uh, what I'm talking about. But that's the that one right there. You're looking for that figure right there. I'm pretty sure that's 276. Yeah. You, no. 270, wait, yeah, 76, I don't know what that's right. I think it's 276, is that right? 76, yeah, fine. So that is a very complex figure. I don't know that I will put it, I'm not sure I won't put anything that complex, but I don't know that I will make it that complex. I, I When I first looked at it and I knew I had, you know, I knew obviously I was going to be solving for the variables and then probably the angles. I didn't know where I would start. It's not a big deal if you look at it and like I have no idea what to do. Don't freak out. I had to say, okay, well, let me just start filling out each piece that I know. They gave me one number, so I know for sure the measure measure of that angle is 60 degrees. That's the only number they gave me. So that was sort of the only real given information. What does this mean here? Those little arrows. What does that mean? What do you think, Waldemar? What does that mean? What are those arrows telling us? Any idea? You've done that before. You guys should know what that is. What do you think it means? That's the measure of that angle. They just couldn't fit all of this stuff in that little tiny space. So they just put it on the outside and they said, the measure of this little skinny angle right here is this, that whole thing. They did the same thing over here. The measure of this angle right here is this. So again, I'll remind you, don't freak out when you see a bunch of variables and numbers in the measure of an angle. Um, all they're doing is they're just representing whatever that measure is. It could be 60, 58. 47, 32, they're just representing that number with some variables and other numbers. Just like I've told you, we can represent $10 with two fives, 10, five and five and ones. Wake up, and I'll repeat this for you when we do it next week and you're lost. You'll learn it on your own. Um, we can represent any number in different ways using equations, or really expressions, but equations. So. Don't freak out when you see that. Now let's see if we can start figuring out some of the other pieces that they haven't necessarily told us. Did they give us any other really valuable information? What do you think, Raina? 
any really valuable information we could use to start putting some numbers, some more numbers in. That symbol thing in there should all recognize. What does that mean? Well, we know that's a right angle. So I'd write into my figure that is 90 degrees. I'd write it down here where I see another one that is 90 degrees. So I haven't even used any like theorems or postulates or any like vertical angles, linear pair, or any of that. I just know that that's the right angle. And the other one's a right angle. Now, once I'm done, now I could say this is this overall angle is 90 degrees. And I could say this overall angle is 90 degrees. Doesn't really get me anywhere yet because that's that's split into two angles. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. It only really helps me if I know that's the measure of one specific angle, but I might need that later. So I might come back to that idea. So I kind of make a note of it. Um, do So now that I don't have any other like numbers I can really put in, the next thing and this is the order I would suggest you go in. Seems to be a pretty common order, I guess, for them to use like the most common things. I think vertical angles is typically the more common thing. Do you see any place where I have vertical angles where there's an X in the figure? Uh, Victor, do you see any X's in that figure? Like where two lines completely go through each other and keep going. Yeah, you can look at your paper, you can look up there. And it's, I'm not saying it's easy to see it, but I truly would see an X somewhere in there. Be vertical lines. See anything? If you're struggling that hard, probably a pretty good indication that there's not. And there's not. Now, if they had continued maybe these two lines, now that would be considered an X right there. We would have vertical angles. But they didn't do that. So in this particular figure, vertical angles does not get us anywhere. Next, you're looking for that linear pair thing we just did a minute ago. Do you see anywhere where there is a line separated into two angles? Third day, you need to wake up also. This is the one day lesson for this. I will not spend my entire period catching you guys up. Figure it out on my Excel. At least watch it. If you're not going to write on it because you got notes, just watch it. Do you see that anywhere? So we do have it here, right? We do have it actually split a couple of times from B to D is actually split into three angles. Now, the only way that's helpful is if we have enough information to solve for an angle that we don't know. We do have 60, so one of the angles is 60, but we don't know either of those two angles. So if we don't know two of them, it's not actually going to help us solve, but we do have it there, so maybe we can come back and use that. And I'll be honest, I didn't even notice that myself. Is there any other line that is split into more than just the, the flat line, like it's split into two or more angles? Square. I like that one. This line down here gets split by that line right there. Not only does it get so, that means these two angles have to add up to 180. And not only does that mean they have to add up to 180, but we know one of those two angles. So when you know one of the two angles, that's when you can solve and keep moving forward with plugging more numbers in. If that's 90 and they have to add up to 180, I now know that angle. Now I have some pretty, I'm actually at a point where I can start solving. Could have started solving actually before this. So what was the first? So again, that's the second thing I look for. Now, by the time I've done these two things, and I do these no matter what, like even if I could have already started solving probably, which I could have, 
I still do that second one just to get more information because maybe there's a faster way to do it if I do that. The third thing is what? The one we learned today or you relearned today. What's true about the interior angles of triangles? Oh, come on. What is it? Say it. Interior of angles of triangles add up to 180. Stop waiting on you. So that's the next thing to look for. Again, this is only when you're dealing with triangles. I, do I have any triangles in there where I know what all three angles are? Like not the, not the final number necessarily, but I have something in each angle. Yeah, what do I have, Ian? Which one? The, the triangle on the right side. Yeah, I have this in one of the angles, right? I filled in part of it myself. And then they had already given me that. So I have three. I know what's in all three angles. So I can create an equation. Now, that equation may not allow me to solve still. I may still have, like, I might have two variables in it when I do this, and then I wouldn't be able to solve. But let's, let's write it and see what we get. And then we'll work from there. So 90 plus x plus 8. You can put parentheses around if you want. I don't, you don't need them, so I didn't do it. So the next thing you have to remember is from algebra. If you have one variable and one equation, you can solve for the variable. Two variables in one equation, you can't. I only have x in that equation. So that means I can solve for x. I'm not going to go through and do it. You're going to be practicing. You're going to be able to do that next week. Um, what about any other triangles? Because that's not the only variable in this figure. Well, Chandler, what else do you see? Anything else I can set up? Any other equations I can set up already? Do I need to try to fill some more stuff? Out? A, B. So you're talking about from here to here to here? Yeah, that triangle has three things also, right? I have something in that angle, something in that angle, and that's what's in the other angle. I can do the same thing. 5 over 4 times y, subtract 45. That's what's in one angle. I now add that to 90. Add that to y. That equals. Again, there's only one variable in that. So one variable, one equation. I can solve for that variable. I've set up both equations that I need. The only thing you need to make sure you do is when you solve for the variable, read the question and ask if they're solve if they want you to solve for the variable or for the angle. If they want the angle, you have to plug that back in and figure out what the angle is. All right, so um, go ahead. That's the end of the lesson. You have some what I think are pretty easy practice problems to get started on. I want you to practice this. Start with there. I want you to practice this for like 10 minutes. Try to do some of the easy ones up top. If you want to try to do harder ones, that's fine. If you want to skip some of the easy ones, I just want to see how you're doing on it. And then I'll say, okay, go ahead and put all that stuff away. Then you can review your notes for the quiz for about 10 minutes, and then we'll do the quiz. But I do want you to practice this for a little while so I see. I don't think it's super difficult, but I need to see what you guys think. And we didn't have enough practice time in the other classes. That's why I went a little faster than and I was recording. I'll need to see how we're doing on it. Uh, I guess I don't even know if that's helpful, but I guess I can get it. So oh, your, your problems you're doing are on page, the very next page, 277. And I think it's like pretty much all of the all the problems. So yeah, one ultimately we're gonna wind up doing one through seventeen. And that's probably good. If you really want to try some trickier ones, 29 and 30, but one through 17 is what we'll eventually get to. I don't expect you to do that meeting today. But go ahead and start working. You can pick whichever ones you want to do for today.
Wait, wait, wait. You need to try to do these problems. Page 277, 1 through 17. Leave your lesson. This is it. All you get. And you'll practice next week, but I'm not doing any more lessons. You move into something else. Uh, phones should not be out. We're not doing IXL at all today for this or for um, your review before the quiz. You can look over the book pages if you want to review something before the quiz, but you don't have time to do IXL. Just by the time you get logged in and actually start, you have time to put it on. I see how you guys are doing on this. All of you, not just one or two of you. Uh, I gotta do attendance real quick, then I'll answer questions if anybody has it. Oh, I totally grabbed the attendance. Yeah. Mm. Today is December first, by the way. Have your stuff in front of you so they can pick it up.
solution or is it? I don't know. I don't know. Pretty good. And just check the chat. Number three. Because what should the is oh wait, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. I'm sorry. Guys. Oh yeah, two and three. Okay, I was I was looking at these three and adding fifty to those two. Or, yeah, okay, that's good. Yeah, I was thinking those two were just an end That's good. Oh, one that which one? This one? Is that I think that's enough of that? One is one oh nine. That is not. There, so now now that you said that again, if you go in this order, that leads you to the answer almost every time. Like 99% of the time, that process gets where you need to go to understand how to recognize. Uh, all right, so if you want to wrap up whatever you're working on there, I'll give you the next like 10 to 15 minutes to review for the quiz. You don't have, you're not doing IXL for it. You're just looking at your book pages, any notes you have on those things. We did bell work. If you want to go back and look at the bell work, how to tell us something is parallel or perpendicular. Um, so when the big hand is on the like probably somewhere between the four and five, I'll go ahead and I'll give you a quiz. I'll give you a little over 30 minutes, which seemed to be the right amount of time for fourth grade. Oh, I don't think I stopped the recording. Whoopsies. Thanks, Jeff. 